Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead. I've thought about a lot of different subjects, but I'm going to tell you what, there seems to be one that's, uh, uh, that's pretty pressing right now, and um, uh, that is, are you prepared for what's coming? You know, and, and I know we've talked about this uh, <coughs> several different times, uh, but it, it seems to be pretty urgent right now. Um, you know, we're, it's, it's nice and cool right now. I mean, I think it's 68 degrees this morning and it's like, uh, you know, it's 520 something in the morning. Um, uh, guys, you know, we just had Hurricane Harvey come in Texas and we saw the devastation that it done down there to those people. And that's not going to go away very quick. You know, no matter how prepared you are for some things, there's some things that you just can't get away from. And, you know, uh, disaster just happens. And we're looking now at Hurricane Irma possibly hitting Miami, Florida, they're talking about, as a direct hit and then running right up through the state of Florida. Or it could come over into the Gulf and come to us here at Deep South Homestead. I mean, or it could go to... The Carolinas, I mean, guys, there's an array of different ways this thing could go, but this is a bad storm. Now, you know, here at Deep South Homestead, we watch all the weather all the time because let's, let's just face it, guys, this country is going through a whole... I don't know, what's the word I want to use? Um, a whole array of cataclysmic type events, uh, you know. And, uh, and us being a YouTube channel, now we're not a big YouTube channel. We're just an average one. You know, we don't, we're not the, you know what, we're not the 100,000 subscriber thing and all that, but but yet we're friends with a lot of YouTube channels across this country. And, and we talk to them on a, on a regular basis. Now, some of them are big channels, you know, some are little channels, uh, some of them are like us, I guess, just run of the mill channels. And a lot of them are telling us about what's going on in their area. You know, we've got people from California talking about the, the drought that they've been through. Um, People up in Washington and Oregon and Idaho talking about the excessive heat that they've been going through and three months with no rain. And then you come across to, uh, well, Idaho now. You've got um, some, some of our friends in Idaho, some of them in um, Oklahoma and Kentucky and different places talking about earthquakes that's never been before a lot of them are blaming it on fracking and different other things you know um <clears throat> the excessive rainfall that we've been having uh in the south in the east so, uh, southeastern part of the united states we've got harvey that's came into texas now devastated southern texas um flooded parts of louisiana Guys, and now we're facing Irma coming in on the East Coast, uh, Southern Florida, maybe going up the East Coast, maybe coming into the Gulf again. We don't know. Then we've got Jose, which is right on its track. You know, it's, you know supposedly the thing may hit 9-11 they're talking about, maybe the most worst part of it going into a city. Guys, look, it's just... And this is just in our country. There's things, we got subscribers all over the world who are sending us stuff from their countries. And it's amazing some of the things that's going on in other countries also. It's not just here. There's global things happening. Now, are they man-made? You know, I can't, I can't sit here and say for sure that they are. Uh, it could be just you know, signs of the times. It could be Earth going through its, you know, cycles. You know, there could be lots of things, but the key thing here is, guys, is are you prepared for, for not having water? Are you prepared for not having anything to eat? Uh, do you have any kind of fuel stocked up? 
you know, do you have any any way to wash your clothes? Um, you know, I know they say, a, you know, in survival things, you need a gallon of water per person per day. But here at, uh, here at Deep South Homestead, we don't follow that rule. <clears throat> we, you'll have to excuse me, my throat is stopping up this morning. I just finished eating breakfast and it's like, like my flea wants to build. Uh, but, you know, we believe two gallons of water per person. And you go, well, Danny, the, the national thing says just one per person. Yeah, but let me tell you something. When you have, this is, uh, I lived through Katrina. You know, I was 26 days without any electricity here at Deep South Homestead. Um, timber down everywhere. No way of getting fuel. I mean, you know, it was just, guys, I, I, I lived that life. And it really, uh, before Katrina, I went, I've been through numerous hurricanes. I, I went through Camille. I mean, I went through, uh, just, I, can't, I don't even want Elena, you know, George. I mean, go. I can just go on through, uh, name them all. They just keep coming up in here. Frederick, all of them come up through this way. <coughs> and never once, never once have I took thought about <clears throat> having to do without anything. I was young, physically fit, pretty much prepared. To me, hurricanes were just a thing that happens. You know, they, they come, they go. But guys, let me tell you something. Hurricane Katrina was an eye-opener for me. Hurricane Katrina, I, I guess the best way, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to describe Katrina to y'all. Those of you who don't know about it, I mean, there are those of you who are watching that actually live through it, too, and you'll, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm trying to figure out the best analogy for Katrina. If any of you have ever been to war and you've ever seen, uh, you've ever seen war devastation, well, war devastation, when they do the, uh, you know, when planes do their sorties and, and they go into the... And they go into the theater, and they, uh, and they, and they drop their batteries, and they do the devastation that they do. It's targets. You know, you have places that look untouched. You have places that look devastated. You know, these these are spotted about. Well, Hurricane Katrina, when it came in, and I'm using it, and those of you that are in other parts of the Gulf and. Uh, East Coast, I mean, you'll have different hurricane names and you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, it was worse than war. Because when Katrina come through, there were no places that were not touched. It looked like a giant bomb had gone off and literally it had wiped everything out everywhere. There was nowhere you could go that anything was normal. And this wasn't just in an isolated spot. This was in miles and miles and miles of this coastal land, inland land. You know, and I know all the attention went to New Orleans, which did get some pretty bad stuff. But guys, the whole Mississippi Gulf Coast, it's never been the same again. When you go down now, it doesn't look like it did uh, before 2005. It looks completely different. I mean, it, wiped, it just wiped everything away. There's uh there's still just slabs down there where the houses are gone that they were supposed to have uh, cleaned all that up. It still hasn't been cleaned up. People just abandoned the land. They left. Uh, they let the county or the city take the land back over. Go to the state. They didn't care. They just get the heck away from here. You know. Uh, in my yard alone, <clears throat> around my house, in a hundred. And I know this because when FEMA came in to do some of the cleanup work, uh, they they measured 150 foot circumference around your house. Uh, from from your house out, they went 150 feet, and uh, 125, 150 is one or the other. Uh, in that circumference or that radius around my house, we had 300 trees on the ground in that circumference around my house. Because when I built this house. I just went into the forest here and I just cleared out what trees I had to to get my house in here. And I left everything outstanding because it was like a utopia. The sun never hit the ground here. After Hurricane Katrina, 
my driveway is a uh, hundred feet from my house here in front of it. From that driveway to my house, you couldn't see my house. My house looked like it was gone. There was that much timber piled up around my house. Now guys, it don't matter what I do to prepare. I can't, I can't change that. Uh, Deep South Homestead was forever changed because my land was completely hardwood, heavy wooded property. That was a utopia for wildlife and um, the sun just never hit the ground anywhere. I mean, we had a few food plots on the back parts of the property where we had some good sunlight for hunting. The guys, when the storm was over and we surfaced, uh, not one tree hit my house. I was thankful for that. It, it was like my house was sitting here. It's like trees were laid and like, like they were stacked all around my house. And God just did an amazing thing in that. But it didn't matter how much preparing I done, I couldn't change what happened. You know, it happened. And and we're forever changed here. Now, during that time, I could not stay in the house. I had to uh, put my tent out here on the porch. I put a piece of plywood on, my, uh, two pieces of plywood on my porch. And I actually screwed my tent down to that and I slept on the porch in a tent because the house stayed over 100 degrees on the inside uh for 20 something days because the outside ambient temperature during the day was over 100 degrees but at night it would cool down to the 70s and sometimes the high 60s um and that's how we lived uh we strung our clothes up on the porch we hand washed i had 100 gallon cattle barrels for, for watering cattle and stuff like that from uh from my herds of cows i used to have we had those filled up with water from the hurricane and I had generators. Uh, we could run, we could run some lights. Uh, we could run the pump to get water. Um, the surging in the power. Now these, I'm going to tell you some things that happened that you may not be aware of that happens. The fact that the power did not just go out instantly like that. Uh, it actually, as the wind would blow the trees on the lines, there were surges in the power. The lights would go off for a few minutes, they'd come back on for a few minutes, they'd go back off, they'd come back on. Um, in the middle of the hurricane, cell, all cell phone towers went down. You know, Then eventually all electricity, the grid just went out. Well, what happened was, during that hurricane, the surges in the electricity from the limbs and the trees blowing on power lines and stuff like that, burnt the circuit boards out in a lot of my appliances because everything's electronic now. It's digital, um, which is one of the reasons why if we ever replace a lot of our stuff, we're going back with non-digital stuff if we can find it. Uh, my, my stove in the house, it burnt the motherboard out in it because of the surges. My washing machine, even though it wasn't being used, it burnt the motherboard out in it, um, the surges in the electricity, uh, which taught me that if anything like this is going to be happening in the future for us, we're going to go through and unplug <clears throat> all of our appliances ahead of time. Now, some things you cannot unplug, like refrigerators and deep freezes and stuff like that. You have to leave them plugged. But fortunately, we did not lose the refrigerators and we did not lose our deep freezes. Even though there were surges, I'm really amazed that the clicks on switch in the back of them with the, for the compressors didn't just go out or the compressors burn up or something. I'm, I'm really amazed that that didn't happen. But God was good and he allowed us to be able to keep our food. Uh, we was able to run generators to uh, keep the refrigerators going and the deep freezes going and keep a little fan blowing on us and keep our water well going. Um, but since we've learned, uh, we've bought some little cheap 110, 5,000 BTU air conditioners in the deep south here when it gets excessively hot like that. A little generator can run an air conditioner at night. Now, we wouldn't run it during the day, but at night, when we're trying to rest, we would try to uh, maybe cool one room in the house with it. Uh, but even at that, guys, you're not able to do those kind of things if you don't have some sort of a fuel storage. Uh, and you want to have cash on hand and you don't want big bills. You want small bills because one of the things we learned during Hurricane Katrina was that when you went to get anything, if you was at a store, uh, if they happened to open up and try to sell some of their stuff and maybe do hand receipts or something like that or some gas, if you found a few service stations that could get back up and they had a little bit of gas left in their tanks, 
uh, they would not take a big bill. Uh, they would tell you, if you don't have anything, if you have anything larger than a 20, I'm sorry. We won't, we, we, we can't serve you. And there was lots of times in stores that um, people who had like a 50 or a hundred dollar bill, they would tell them, look, all I can tell you is get at the end of the line and maybe enough small bills will come through that we can make change for you, but we're not going to get rid of all of our small bills because we have to have them to make change for people. Um, so one of the things you want to think about is keep small bills on hand. Um, you want to keep, uh, you want to keep at least, uh, a couple of weeks wages on hand because it may be a couple of weeks before you're able to actually go back to work or get fuel. Um, and lots of, lots of people where I live at had to drive uh, several states away to get fuel. And then you have to run the risk of road pirating. Um, even during Katrina, the National Guard was stopping people who had fuel and would confiscate the fuel sometimes. Uh, uh, if anybody thought for one moment that you had fuel, they'd try to take it. If they thought you had food, um, I was, I was at a place where the guy who had, um, who had 18 wheelers of food coming into his business and he would tell the people, look, now this is for you. Don't go out telling people that this is here. Well, of course, you know, somebody leaked the information out and the next thing he knew there were hundreds of people at his business. They were wanting to get that food and the food was set aside for the people in his businesses. And he quickly realized that he just became over, he he couldn't handle the people. They just got to be too violent and everything. And so he had to call the companies out of state and tell them, look, don't send any more money. And he told his employees, he said, look, you did this to yourself. I tried to help you, you know? And he said, so there's going to be no more coming. I'm not bringing it back here because y'all broke the rules. And now I can't control the people coming in here. There's just massive herds of people coming in because they weren't prepared. And guys, a lot of people go, why do y'all prepare so much at Deep South Homestead? And guys, it's for, it's not for the end of the world. I get so aggravated with people when they think that we're preparing for the end of the world. No, we're not. The world's not going to end. Let me just say that, okay? The world's not going to end. Not no time soon, anyway. We are preparing for life-changing events, whether they're physical events, you have to have surgery, or you get hurt, or you get sick. Um, we're preparing for man, uh, or, or man-made disasters, um, whether it be a, a, you know, some, some chemical plant blows up or whatever happens. Uh, there's a chemical spill or something like that, and, and, or there, there's, you know, one of the oil field companies have problems and you can't get fuel and stuff like that. That's what we prepare for. Weather um, coming in, hurricanes, tornadoes, where there's tears up the infrastructure, there's no electricity, you can't get anything. Guys, those are the kind of things we're talking about. We're just, what we're trying to do is just tell you what our forefathers done. Our forefathers did what we did and they called it life. They didn't call it preparing. They called it life. It was everyday life for those. They didn't spend their times in in buggies or in cars or whatever, running back and forth to stores getting stuff. They made one trip to the store once a month to get a few staple items. Now, I'm using the word staple because they raised and took care of everything else they had. Now, you had people who lived in the cities. Don't, don't get me wrong. I understand that. But guys, even people who lived in the cities during the Great Depression and, and before then, uh, if you go back and do your historical studies, they had victory gardens. Uh, almost every little household in the city had some kind of little flower bed gardens. They had container gardens. They had rabbits in cages. I mean, there's just numerous stories out there about, uh, about some of the things that different people had during those times. Um, and so we... We think when we think about preparing, guys, I mean, don't stress. Stress is the number one issue during some sort of life changing event like a storm or or something. And I know guys, these roosters in the back. There it's it's early in the morning, you see daylight coming with me. But uh, guys, you know, there's lots of things that we have to think about and stress is probably one of the number one problems 
during a life-changing event. And I realized how quick that was during Katrina. Because even though I wasn't really that concerned about a lot of things, I knew we had food, I knew we could get water, I mean, I knew all these things. But in the back of my mind, I also knew that I only had a certain amount of fuel. I had to use it wisely. Um, I had only so much gas in gas bottles to run the charcoal grill, I mean to run the gas grill, and I have a small oven that runs off of a, a propane gas. Uh, you know, I have all, I have everything I need for a storm. But God, let me tell you something. I can have all this stuff, but if the storm comes in and tears up everything I have, and these things are torn up and gone, then I have nothing. So then I have to know bush skills. I have to know how to get out I have to know how to create a fire pit out of nothing. I have to know how to gather the wood. I have to know how to cook on stuff. You know, there's there's all these things that play into the equation. It's it's never it's never what it seems. And and the fact that stress is one of the biggest issues that you will encounter. Um, and it's because of this. And I'm trying to I'm trying to word this right. Stress, what makes it so bad and what causes it is that it takes you out of your comfort zone. Um, as humans, we live ritualistically and uh, systematically. Uh, we have a daily routine <clears throat> that we are used to. And when this daily routine is broken, then we begin to stress ourselves and we have to we're out of our comfort zone we have to do things that we're not used to doing and maybe we don't get to go to work um and we're sitting back going oh my gosh i'm not working today uh what do i do i mean i'm not going to have money to pay my my house note this month i'm not going to have money to pay my electric bill when it comes back on i'm not going to have money to do this i don't have money to do that guys these are stresses that's why i tell you you want two weeks of income in cash on hand in small bills stuck away in a safe or something you want all of your medical supplies if you have medicine you want at least a two-week supply of medicine in advance of a major event like a hurricane coming in you want all of your important papers where you can grab them you want them inside a plastic big giant plastic ziploc bag to keep them from getting wet you want your medicine in the same thing um, you want plenty of batteries if you plan on riding this thing out for flashlights. Uh, I prefer the wind up and crank radios. We have, we have several of those. We have several of the, uh, different types of flashlights. Uh, we have the LED click on little lights that can burn up to 10, uh, up to a thousand hours. I mean, we have all that kind of stuff here. We have the shaking flashlights that you can do. Uh, God, there's, you know, we try to prepare for everything, but... I don't know that it's possible to prepare for everything because you could have all of this and if you live in an area that could go underwater, uh, you could lose it all. That's just the bottom line. You could prepare all this food up, you could put it in five gallon buckets and you could you could can it, you could do all this stuff and then your house fills up with water and you lose everything. You know, you could freeze dry stuff, vacuum seal it and all. It may float around on everything, but you know, still it's possible you could lose it. Those buckets banging into stuff, floating in the water, you know, punching holes in this and that. I mean, things can happen. Not to mention the contamination on the outside of everything. Because during these major events like hurricanes and stuff like that, um, uh, contamination is one of the biggest issues because sewers overflow, uh, streets get flooded with sewage, um, all types of bacterial infections sets in. You know, that's why you need a medical kit with different types of antibiotics and stuff like this in it so that you can, um, uh, you need a good medical kit. Let me just put it that way. You just need a good first aid kit with, with, and you need antibiotic topical creams. You need all these kind of things in these kits. Now, like I said, let's say one gallon per person per day. We do two gallons per person per day simply because we don't want the stress of saying, uh, oh, wow, I may not have enough water to make it. And we're having to watch this one gallon. Well, if you've got two gallons, it gives you a little bit of more freedom in your mind. 
And there's some things you want to keep on mind. You know what I mean? You want sweets. Uh, the brain needs sugar to work. If it doesn't have sugar, then it doesn't work properly. And I know if you're a diabetic, you have to watch that. But as a bottom line, you need some sort of uh, some sort of a sweet to put back in your system so that you can just get that. I don't know. It's like a It's like it helps you to overcome Some of the obstacles if sometimes you can just get something sweet in your system and plus it's energy and you need energy um, During that time you need uh, you need stuff that has high caloric intakes to it You need things that has proteins to give them to you. You need meals that are quick That's why at deep south homestead you see us can as much as we do uh, once we've canned stuff you don't have to have a, a stove to eat if it's been canned. You can open the jar. Now, granted, it may not be hot, but once again, you're outside your comfort zone. It's not like you're living like this forever. You're trying to survive. You can open a jar of food that you've been that you've already pressure cooked or a water bath or whatever. You can eat it straight from the jar. You know, you don't have to have a stove. Guys, these are just tips that helps get you through these things. I know. That's the way we lived after Hurricane Katrina. To be honest with you, I ate, I ate better after Hurricane Katrina than I did before Hurricane Katrina, simply because I had all this food stored up in a deep freeze, and I didn't know how long I was going to have gas, so the biggest issue was we was eating steak, we was eating shrimp, we was eating all these kind of good things that we had stored up in that freezer. We was just eating this one day right after another because we didn't want to lose it, you know? But it also taught me a good lesson that those meats, a lot of them should have been canned. And if it had been canned, I would not have had to worry about it. Now, yes, we do have several freezers right now full of food, and we would stand to lose a lot. But what would happen for Wanda and I, because we don't owe a mortgage or anything like that, uh, we've been wise enough to get out of debt. Um, if something like this happened, what we would do is we'd, we have the facilities here to build an outside fire. We have rocket stoves and all these kind of things we would immediately begin to start canning the stuff that's in our freezer because uh, we have plenty of jars, plenty of lids, and we would, we, because we're prepared, you know, that's what we would do. Guys, I hope that, um, I, I know I've gone on long enough, I'm sitting here looking at the camera, I've gone pretty long, uh, but when you get into something like this, sometimes there's just a lot of information, and I could keep going, um, but I don't want to, I don't want everything to be too long. Uh, and I know because a lot of you have to go to work, you know, and you don't have so much time to listen to something like this. But it is our desire here at Deep South Homestead to, you know, to say, hey, be prepared. Because it, well, what's coming, it looks like we may be facing some more things in this country. So uh, those of you on the southern tip of Florida and up the eastern coast and along the Gulf of Mexico, on the west coast, you know, there's been some predictions that there's going to be some pretty bad stuff happen. So... Guys, let's just say, let's keep a heads up, let's pray for one another, and let's look out after one another, and let's just, uh, let's lean on the Lord, because when we, one of our number one preparing things is trusting in the Lord. Be prepared spiritually for whatever may happen in your life today. Thank you for watching um, Porch Time today, and we will see you uh, hopefully tomorrow on another video. Thank you from Deep South Homestead.